Church, it is good to be with you. Good morning. It is fun to watch you worship and to be in your midst. Let me pray for us as we worship through God's word. Father, we thank you that indeed you are eager to speak to us. So Lord, as we consider your words to us from Ephesians, Father, I pray that we'd be listening. Lord, we may trust that this is not just a, a casual gathering, but Lord, that you are looking to do something special here today. So Father, we thank you, Lord, that you've drawn us to yourself. We give you praise for that. We pray that you would speak to us. Would you bless the reading of your word? In Jesus' name, amen. Uh, our, our text today is from Ephesians. It's going to be from chapter 4 and chapter 5. I'm going to bounce around a little bit, so I'll tell you where I'm reading from, and possibly it'll be on the screen. I'm not sure. Ephesians 4, verse 25, reads this way. Therefore, having put away falsehood, let each of you speak the truth with his neighbor, for we are members of one another. Dropping down to verse 29. Let no corrupting talk come out of your mouths, but only such as is building good for building up, as it fits the occasion, that it may give grace to those who hear. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and slander be put away from you, along with all malice. Dropping down to chapter 5, verse 4. Let there be no filthiness, nor foolish talk, nor crude joking, which are out of place, be amongst you. But instead, let there be thanksgiving. Drop down to verse 18. And do not get drunk with wine, for that is debauchery, but be filled with the Spirit, addressing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody to the Lord with your heart, giving thanks always for, in, for everything to God the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Blessed be the reading of God's word. Well, friends, I am eager to preach with you, to talk with you this morning, and to think about our words. Have you thought about what you've said to one another this morning? Have you thought about what you've said to the Lord this morning? Know this, that our words, they are not just casual things that come from our mouths, but they, are, they reveal so much, and they communicate so much, and I want us to think deeply about them today. There are times in our lives when we are incredibly intentional and thoughtful about the words that we say. Sometimes they're um, good, sometimes they're bad. I can think of when high school, when uh, going out quite a bit too fast, a friend and I found ourselves in the courtroom of a judge, and the judge looked at Joe and said, what were you guys thinking going so fast that day? The proper words of his mouth would not have been to say, I don't know, but it sure was fun. <laughs> no, those would not be thoughtful words to come from his mouth. A thoughtful word might have been something much more demeanor, much more, I'm so sorry, judge. There are positive times when words come from our mouth that we can be intentional about and, and, and think about deeply. I just got to officiate a wedding yesterday. It was a beautiful joining together of a young woman and a young man, which reminded me of my wedding day 18 some years ago. As I stood before that officiate and had me recite vows back and forth, and then he asked, do you? And with an intentionality, I said, I do. There are times in our lives we need to think with intention about what we are saying and what we are speaking. But all too often, our words, they just flow from the normal ebb and flow of the, of the day, and we don't think about what we're necessarily saying. It's all too easy to what, let words come from our mouths that we don't necessarily intend or that we'd regret later. Well, today in our series for Letters for Life, we're going to be considering that as builders of God's living temple, which is the place where God's glory dwells, we want, I want us to consider that we primarily build the church with our words and that, therefore, every word matters. We're going to consider our words the three realms of building. The scriptures, when it talks about the New Testament church, it talks about it in three different realms. It talks about the body and the bride and the building or temple of Christ. Tonight, today, we're going to talk about the, the body and what it means to be the temple. And we're going to talk about crafting with meticulous care the words that proceed from our mouth. First of all, before we jump in, though, I want us, before we drop into Paul's imperatives from this text, I want us to think about the first word that, he, that I read from Ephesians chapter 4, verse 25. He says, Therefore, having put away falsehood, let each of you speak the truth with his neighbor. This word, therefore, is a transitional word linking together what Paul's been writing previously. We said it in our call to worship in our, in our confession today that he lays out that before we were children of wrath, 
separated from God. We did not know him, and we were foolish and stubborn in our hearts against him and, and, and foolish in how we treated our neighbors. But by God's grace, he pierced our heart, and we changed us. He allowed us to be drawn near. So we called it later in chapter 3, he says, we are brothers of one body. We have been brought near to worship God. So as I get ready to talk about the imperatives of this chapter 4, Realize, brothers and sisters, that that therefore is an incredibly powerful word. It says these things are true of you. You've been brought near into the body of Christ by the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. And so therefore we are to live out how we speak with our mouths appropriately based on who we are. Well, I love the language of, uh, that he uses, and I also love that he links this idea of building <clears throat> to 1 Peter chapter 2, where Peter uses the imagery of building. He says that we are living stones of the temple of God, and we are built up as a spiritual house. Now, I love building. Um, the fun thing of being in ministry is I'm constantly working with people, and people are often works in progress. But when I think about construction with my hands, it's so fun to start a project and to finish it and bring it to com completion. That's why I love building. When we bought our house in 2010 and moved here, um, it was, we wanted to be close to Hampus, and it was what we could afford. And that house, after the first year, we had to have an HVAC person come out and service our air conditioner because it just would not work. And we had to have a roofing person come out and repair a leak in our roof because it leaked in our living room. And then after a year and a half, we had to have the same HVAC guy back out to our house and the same roofing guy back out to our house. And by the third time when Barrett and I were the second year of living in that house with a five-gallon bucket in the living room collecting rainwater as it dripped through our ceiling, I said, babe, I think we're going to have to do what the professionals have told us. They have told us since we moved in here that the pitch of our roof is so low that the AC can't properly be ducted and work properly. And the, the rain guy, the roof guy, said the, sh the pitch is so low that the shingles actually don't work. We knew that, but he says that the, so, the pitch is so low that the water wicks up underneath the shingles, and that's why, we're having roof, that's why we're having rain in our living room. So I said, babe, I think it's time that we raise the roof. And so we thought about raising it a foot, but in the end, we decided, why raise it a foot? We can raise it 30 feet. So this is a picture of my house as we bought it. And then over the course with a lot of blood, sweat, and several, plenty of tears, we built that. And it's a beautiful thing, and we're so thankful for it. But here's my point. Next slide, please. If how we did it, I talked some recent college grads and to come over to my house, I erected scaffolding on my roof, and I started to build, and I had those guys shove boards up to me one at a time as I nailed them into the top ridge board. Do you know that when you build a roof on top of your house, if you do not build it exactly at a 90 degree angle and everything precisely laid out, that when you put that first piece of four foot by eight foot sheathing on the corner, the plywood to put the shingles on later, if you don't put it on exactly right, by the time you build and build and then build on top of it, time you get to the corner, some of it might not even be lying on the, the rafters that you've previously erected. That might not be true with my house, I'm not saying, but just for those, you need to know, you need to build with meticulous care, even if you're simply a framing crew. You have to build with intentionality, thinking about what the, what the end result is, and you have to build meticulously, or when you get to the corner, things will not go well for you. We have to think about our words, Paul is exhorting us. He says, put away falsehood. This falsehood is where we get our word pseudo. How many times have we been in a community like this and we'll walk in and someone will say, how you doing? And we'll say, fine. But just below the surface, we're not. It's like when we show up to a, a high school class reunion after 20 or 25 years and you've worked furiously to lose 20 pounds to arrive at that place or you've rented the car to show up in something a little bit nicer than you normally drive, trying to put on a facade of like, I'm doing well. The reality is, as the scriptures say, that when we're in community, we need to think with care about how we're speaking to one another and not put on falsehood, not to have pseudo-community. But when someone says, how are you doing? And you hear someone say, I'm doing okay. To have the guts to say, really? And then if they say, well, actually, it's been hard. To listen and to be able to speak truth to remind them of what is true and what is right and what is good and the hope that we have in Christ. 
That's what we need to be in this community. That's what Paul is saying when he says put away falsehood. But then he goes on to the hard things that slap us around. In verse 31, he lays out the sinful six. He says, he exhorts, let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and slander be put away from you along with all malice. Let me just walk through them real quick. The speech of bitterness has a harshness to it, a resentfulness that you can taste in the tinge of the, 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 what's been scooped out of the vat, a harshness. Have you ever heard the, make an easily, seemingly innocent comment, oh, those darn politicians, they're so far away in, in D.C., they're making things that impact my life, and it's just, they, they, they don't think about anything for the common man. Those words of harshness, of bitterness, are being, are, they're, just, they're right on the surface. They don't, you don't quite know how to take them, but just below you realize there's a bitterness there that's not appropriate for the people of God. If we're bitter about how our life is going and that things just keep being way too difficult as what as it should be, <clears throat> we have to trust that the Lord knows what he's doing and he's still good. We have to put away that bitterness. <clears throat> Paul says the speech of bitterness is not fitting for one who's been, become part of the body. We have to put it away. When you speak of those politicians, do you not know that possibly those are your fellow brothers and sisters in the Lord? The Lord might just be at work in their lives, crafting and shaping them as they're a stone being put in the living temple. Did you know that your stone, like you literally might be for all eternity, a stone right next to them, giving songs of praise to our king? We have to be gracious with how we speak to one another and how we have to speak to the larger body of Christ. If we're putting down that church over there for how they go about pursuing Christ, we need to be careful and not speak with bitterness about how, how they're doing it. Paul says we need to put away wrath. The words of wrath have a context of, of passionate outburst of rage. They're the kind that we don't know are within us, but they just bubble up. Now, we live in a time of relative peace, but you can imagine the first century when Paul was reading the, is writing these words and the persecution that was going on by Nero. You have to understand that words of wrath, how much they can divide a church. They can cause martyrdom when the government comes in because words have been spoken that weren't appropriate. You have to imagine when they were writing the pen and the, the, the words of the Westminster Confession or the times of the, of the Reformation, when they're arguing over theology, those are, it's, it's important to have right doctrine, but we can't use words of malice and anger as we're trying to hammer home what we believe. We can't have outbursts of anger. It's not appropriate for the body of Christ. Paul says to boy, put away speech of anger. This has the nuance of impulsive vengeance. He says speech of clamor is not right. The speech of clamor, it's like it's the shrieking, outcrying, screaming kind of language. I picture a, a fight in a, in a high school gym, like, you know, dining room of like a whole gaggle of 10 girls at each other. And finally the principal comes and they says, she did it, she did it. And like, you know, that was my high school days. Um, like that kind of speech is, it accomplishes nothing. And it's not appropriate for the body of Christ. The word slander is blasphemia, which is literally where we get our word blaspheme. Paul says we are not to slander one another. This kind of speech is to be put away. Now you might be thinking, Darren, I love everyone in here. This is church. These are my people. This is where I'm, I, I am comfortable in this place. I don't use words of slander with people that I love. Brothers and sisters, Note where these words in the chapter 4, where they lie in the overall book. Chapter 1, how does it start? To the church of Ephesus, my faithful brethren in the Lord, dearly beloved. All positive. 1, 2, and 3, all words of, but you've been brought near. Christ has saved you by his grace. But don't you realize as soon as he starts moving into the imperatives, the first thing that he has to address in chapter 4 is their speech? We need to be cautious and thoughtful, intentional, meticulous when we craft words about one another or with one another. That's what's appropriate, that we may build the body, the living temple of Christ with precision such that when we get to the completed portion, everything is right and as it should be. We need to speak with meticulous care. Our second point is this. As craftsmen empowered by the Spirit and realizing that every word matters, we must meticulously craft words to ourselves. Sometimes I feel like the harshest words that we can speak that spew from our heart are not words that we speak to each other or about somebody else. 
<clears throat> but it's the words that we speak to ourselves. That self-talk that goes on in our head. Paul, I believe, is also linking this is that we should not speak this way. We are to put off language that is not true. If the enemy is speaking words to you of inadequacy, if the, if the enemy is speaking words to you of you've blown it again, how dare you claim the name of Christ? Brothers and sisters, you must put away this, this thinking, this falsehood, this way of speaking. It is not right. You are the, here's the fun part. When I look around at you in the morning, I think we are a beautiful, well, First Peter says, temple of the living God. That's what God says is true of you. You are a living stone in his temple, the place where God's glory dwells. Now, you might say, well, Darren, God's glory dwells everywhere. God is, creation is beautiful. The trees are amazing. The sunsets around here are incredible. And the wedding I was at yesterday was, it was beautiful. Well, the seraphim cry out in chapter 6 of Isaiah, holy, holy, holy it is, is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. It's true. The whole earth is full of the glory and the splendor of our king. But at the same time in the temple, his glory dwells in a unique way that is unlike any other way that his glory dwells. God created all the earth and he said it is good, but it was in the garden with Adam and Eve where God dwelled with them in a unique way that he wasn't dwelling in the rest of creation at that time. The same way when, when Moses built the tabernacle, it says this in Exodus 40. Here's how it says. Upon completion, the cloud covered the tent of meeting and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle such that the Moses was not able to enter the tent of meeting because of this filling. In a similar way, when, God, when, when Solomon built the temple, it said this in 1 Kings, the priest brought the ark of the covenant of the Lord into the most holy place, and when the priest came out of the holy place, a cloud filled the house of the Lord, so that the priest could not stand to minister because of the cloud, for the glory of the Lord filled the house the glory of the Lord you went in a, in a unique way in those places. Can you imagine the builders after they finally erected the tapestry in the Holy of Holies? Or the builders as they finally brought the ark in and they placed it just right on the wood, on the, on the things that they had carved and made. And they said, whoa, this is amazing. And they walked out. What was it like when God's glory came thundering in and filled that place? The word glory is the word Kave, which is where we take the word kavod, it means heaviness. God's heavy presence filled that place in a unique way, in a way not such as the whole rest of creation. God says that when we gather as the temple, as the living stones, of the temple of Christ, his glory dwells among us. When I look at you, I think you should be saying to yourselves that inner speech within your mind, I'm a glorious part of the building of the temple of God, the sacred place where his glory dwells in a unique way. That is what is true of you, brothers and sisters, if you are indeed in Christ. Now know this, if your heart doesn't resonate with the things of the church and you're just here for the first time thinking about these things, thinking, what? What are we talking about? Know this, that this text says, he says, do not grieve the spirit. As he's telling them to put away all these things, put away this speech, he's saying this based upon the first three chapters. The reality is the scriptures say that without Christ, we are separated from God and we are under wrath, but it doesn't have to remain and be that way. Turn your heart to him. Repent. Reply in words to God of personal confession. Lord, I want you. I need you. I want to be your temp the place where your glory dwells inside of me. Confess to him and know that it is of his son that he says, of Jesus, he says, in him I am well pleased. And it is through the words of the apostles, through Peter and then the apostles, where he says that my glory will, that it will not be thwarted and the gates of hell will not proceed against this gospel, this message that you have to share. The beauty of the message that, that, that Paul says is like it, the gospel is for everyone who will bow their knee before the king and let him usher him in. Brothers and sisters, we need to be careful how we speak to ourselves. Every word matters. The last point I want us to consider is that every word matters. Therefore, we must meticulously craft words of worship and praise to God. 
Paul says in Ephesians 5, addressing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody to the Lord with your heart, giving thanks always and for everything to God the Father in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, giving thanks always and for everything. But those things are not always easy to do, are they? But it's what we're commanded to do. This type of speech, this type of building is not We can't do it in and of ourselves. We are not capable. After I completed the the, the upstairs of our house, we had a long dining room. And I decided I wanted to build a table to go in our dining room that would fit the space and would be able to be used in my family and bless our family and might even be able to be passed on down to my children or grandchildren, something of heirloom quality that would be wonderful. But here's the thing. I can frame a house or do some electrical work or HVC, you know, I can do some drywall work, but building something of heirloom quality, a table like that, that was out of my realm of ability. I needed a helper. And by God's grace, my sweet, dear friend, David Franz, is the helper I needed. If you do not know David Franz, he's a member of our church, and he worked for 10 years as a professional carpenter, amongst all the other things. He's incredibly talented. I called my friend David. I said, David, I want to build a temple, or I'm sorry, a table. <laughs> I said, I, want, I don't worship the table, trust me. But I said, I, uh, I want to build a table. Would you help me? And what I lacked in ability and skill, David Franz possesses. And I simply apprenticed under him as we built a table. There's the top of it in its pre-finished stage, and there's how it turned out. It's a beautiful piece of work that David built because David had the ability. Dear friends, as we think about crafting words of worship to our God and our King, we lack the ability to do so in and of ourselves. We need the Holy Spirit to be working through us to give us the ability to speak these words. And he promises that he will. He tells us, Paul says, be filled with the reality that God actually wants to fill you. That you may be able to speak words of blessing and encouragement in an appropriate time, in a meticulous way that builds up the body of Christ. And here's the fun thing. When you build those, when you speak those words together, know that you are not alone in doing it. Speaking words of beautiful craftsmanship that echo for all eternity in praise of our king, listen to what it says in Hebrews chapter 12, or chapter 2, verse 12. This quotes Jesus speaking words to the Father. He says this, I will tell of your name to my brothers. In the midst of the congregation, I will sing your praise Jesus, in the midst of the congregation, sings the Father's praise. And how is he doing so? He is quoting Psalm 22. The words of David that were written previously, he is singing those words to the Father. What have we done here today, brothers and sisters? We have uttered words of the scriptures to one another, just like our brother Jesus does. Listen to Psalm 95 as Jesus, our worship leader, no doubt will someday be singing these words to the Father. He will say, oh, come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord, our maker, for he is our God and we are the people of his pasture. Did you hear the words, the pronouns that he is reciting when he recites that work of David? Jesus, our brother, who's become incarnate with us, is us, we'll be singing the words of the scriptures and he'll be saying, our Father. Can you imagine being gathered around the throne as Jesus looks around at you and as he looks around at me with that language of inclusiveness and saying, I have become one of you that we might be singing praise to our King, to God the Father throughout all eternity and he leads us with beautiful words of praise. I think that's pretty amazing. And that shapes how we should think about our words today. This is no just gathering, a normal thing we do every week on a Sunday. No, no, dear brothers and sisters, we are the gathered church, the place where God's glory dwells. We are speaking words that Christ himself will be speaking for all eternity, giving praise to our king. And that is awesome. 
So in closing, be encouraged that God says that you are builders of his living temple, the place where his glory dwells. We build through our words, and we must use meticulous care in doing so. We must put away speech that is not fitting for the body of Christ or what should be coming from our mouths. We may be cautious and thoughtful about the words that we listen to and speak inside our head to ourselves and and replace the lies with truth. And we must also rejoice that we will be singing words of praise to our king forever with our brother Christ leading the choir. And that will be incredible. Let me pray for us. Father, we thank you that you indeed are good. Lord, that you are worthy of our words of worship and praise. Father, may we speak words that are building up one another. Lord, help us to be intentional in how we do so. May we be attentive to look for ways to speak truth and kindness. Lord, we know we need it. Lord, we are grateful that you will empower us with your spirit to do so, not only now, but for all eternity. And for this, we give you praise in Jesus' name. Amen.